These are the entrepreneurs, creators, investors, and builders who ambitiously change to the world. Explore the hardships and heroisms of everyday life while we reveal the key moments to leave behind a lasting legacy. This is Ambition Today with Kevin Siskar. In early 2017, Founder Institute announced a new initiative, the Star Fellowship. The goal was to inspire and empower entrepreneurs to build 500 new space-related businesses by the year 2025. What we wanted to do was help cultivate astropreneurship, and we did this in partnership with some of the world's foremost leaderships, leaders in space, entrepreneurship, and innovation to simplify the complex process of launching a space startup. I was really excited about this endeavor, and during this time, I became fortunate to meet with some of the most amazing space industry experts, people over the New York Space Alliance here in New York City. I even got to meet my first astronaut during the release of the Sparks and Honey Report, uh, Space Exploration Brought Down to Earth. It was a pleasure. I got to meet former NASA astronaut Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, who holds the all-time American record for the number of spacewalks at 10 and a total spacewalk duration of 67 hours, 40 minutes. So as we've been helping all these star fellows build space companies through Founder Institute, uh, earlier this year I heard NASA was scouting for social media people. I applied for credentials, and a few months later, to my surprise, uh, they actually selected me to go to NASA, go to Cape Canaveral for the launch of the Parker Solar Probe. The Parker Solar Probe is NASA's first ever mission to touch the sun. It will be using seven gravity assists as it flies by Venus on the next seven years to slowly shrink and slow its orbit around the sun. This is going to bring it as close as 3.8 million miles on its closest orbit, which will be seven times closer than any spacecraft has been to the sun before, and it will eventually become the fastest man-made object ever to exist at 430 thousand miles per hour relative to the sun. NASA stated that the spacecraft will go close enough to the sun to watch the solar wind speed up from subsonic to supersonic, and it will fly through the birthplace of the highest energy solar particles. It's one of the biggest discovery missions NASA's done in a long time. Uh, and I, if you could actually go back on my Twitter a little bit, this happened last month. For me, it was one of the most ex amazing experiences I, I, I've had in my lifetime. We got to be three miles from the launch, watch it firsthand. We got to walk on the, on the launch pad of the Apollo program where the astronauts used to go. We got to see the command centers. We got to go on NASA TV. Everything about this trip was, was amazing for me. Um, and, and, I really, really did love it. Previously that week, SpaceX did a, a, a Falcon 9 launch on uh, the Of Course I Still Love You pad. We had to go over to the uh, Canaveral Cape and go see, go see that coming back in. The whole trip was amazing. Uh, if you want to keep up with the Parker Solar Probe, you can, you can go online and check that out. It's going to be reporting data back to Earth for, for everyone to see. Um, but one of my favorite parts of this trip, and big props to the people at NASA for helping me here, was I got to have an interview with um, one of the mechanics design engineers who helped build the probe over at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. So Felipe was amazing. He took some time to answer some of my questions around the Parker Solar Probe, what it's doing, why it's important. Um, and so I wanted to take a little bit of a, you know, an episode here, make it a little different, but you know, we've done that before with our cryptocurrency episodes, um, and share with you, you know, what, what, uh, Felipe had to share. Um, and we also dived a little bit into, you know, in ambition today fashion, we dived a little bit into his own story, you know, his own background and how, you know, he came to be someone who's literally built something that is going to be the fastest man-made object ever to exist and is going to go literally touch the sun um, to provide data and learnings for all of humanity. So really inspiring. Um, big shout out to Felipe for taking the time, NASA for helping make this possible. Um, and without further ado, I give you uh, Felipe Ruiz from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and NASA's Parker Solar Probe. This is Ambition Today. This is going to be a little bit of a different episode. I'm here down at NASA's Cape Canaveral uh, for the Parker Solar Launch. We're launching a probe into the sun. Uh, and I'm going to be interviewing a few guests that have been integral in this, in this massive mission, one of the biggest missions NASA's had in years. Uh, Felipe, welcome to Ambition Today. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about, about this mission. You know, you're the first person I've talked to on, on the pod here. Uh, over high level, what is it and, and what's your role in it? Sure. So my name is Felipe Ruiz. I am the deputy lead mechanical engineer for the Parker Solar Probe. 
and uh, we're as excited about this mission as you are. Uh, this is a mission that's been in the works for over 60 years. This is a mission that predates NASA. Really? And we're not only going to go to the sun, we're going to touch the sun. We're going to fly to the sun's corona. And it's a spot of the solar system that nobody's ever been before. It's one of the last spots where this will be the first time we get to explore it. Uh, we're really excited because we're trying to solve some of these mysteries that have been baffling us for years and years about the sun. One of the biggest being why the sun's atmosphere is hotter than the solar surface. So, for example, you start at the sun's center and it's hot, and that makes sense. Right. As you go out towards the photosphere, it gets colder. This is like closer sense. to Mercury, Venus. So this, this For, is further away from the core. It's actually hotter than at the core. You're saying. So further away from the core until you get to the sun's essentially the surface, the photosphere, it's colder. And that's like the Earth. That makes sense. The core is hot. The surface is cold. And you would expect as you got further away from the solar surface, it would continue to get colder, and it doesn't. It gets hotter and it gets hotter by orders of magnitude. The sun's corona is in the millions of degrees. Interesting. And we don't understand why. It's, it's like water flowing uphill for us. There's some energy source there that we haven't seen, and we don't have a way to measure it from Earth's vantage point. We actually have to go in and get in situ measurements. So how is, how is the Parker Solar Probe going to measure that? I mean, this feels like, to me, an outsider looking in on, on NASA, right? Sure. This feels like the biggest mission since Curiosity, right? Like, <laughs> like people are talking about yeah, it, Yeah, right? definitely. So like, um, you know, how, how are you guys gonna figure this out? Yeah, so from, from an engineering point of view, we have a huge challenge because to get these critical measurements of the solar winds, the magnetic and electric fields, and high energy and low energy particles that will really help to solve the theory of the why this happens, we have to be there. There's no way to put a telescope on Earth. There's no way to send a, a satellite, either Earth orbital or even a little closer that gets you the right data. You have to be there. You have to sample the particles from the source. It's, from an engineering point of view, an incredible challenge because yeah. it's an extreme environment. Yeah, I mean, how does this thing not just go to like, you know, disintegrate uh, the moment yeah. it gets anywhere even and, close? And so that's been our <laughs> big <the> problem. <laughs> and that's the reason it's taken us 60 years to build this mission. We haven't had materials that can stand up to that heat and are light enough to launch on rockets that we have today. The big breakthrough for us was our thermal protection system. Okay. And when you look at the spacecraft, the top of the spacecraft is this big circular heat shield. It's made out of a carbon, carbon composite face sheet with carbon foam in the middle. And it's all carbon, there's nothing else there's to it. Uh, on top, we have a white coating which helps reflect some of the heat. Nice. And that's really our only protection from the sun. And it's only about three and a half inches thick. The way we fly the mission is when we're near the sun, we point that shield at it. And the rest of the spacecraft hides in the shade. We have a couple brave instruments that are, that are out there in the full solar blast. But by hiding most of the spacecraft in the shade, it allows us to run Everything was kind of around room temperature. Yeah, I, I heard that line. It's like room temperature. Yeah. It seems insane. Yeah, and, and so the temperatures are at the top of the shield, we see 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, when you go through the three and a half inches of the shield to the bottom of the shield, we're at around 600. And by the time you get from the shield to the top of the spacecraft bus where we have our electronics, where we have our instrument packages, we're around uh, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. That's and amazing. That's where we stay near Solar Encounter. That's amazing. So this wouldn't be ambition today if I didn't dive a little bit into the, our guest's background. Mm -hmm. How did you come to NASA? You know, how, tell me <laughs> just really, really quickly, what's your story? So it's, it's a little bit of a convoluted story. I was born in the U.S. to Colombian parents. Okay. Um, and I, I actually grew up in Bogota as a little kid. And I remember growing up as a little kid watching movies like Apollo 13 and Armageddon and thinking this is just the coolest thing in the world. But coming from Colombia, it was never real to me in the sense that it was actually something you could do. Yeah. It was always, uh, this is, I'm a little kid and I want to be Superman or Spider-Man. Um, in middle school, my family moved to Houston and I went to Johnson Space Center for the first time. And for me, it went from being, this is something out of a fairy tale to this is something you can actually do. Yeah. And um, in high school, I got involved in FIRST Robotics, which opened up a couple doors for an internship at Johnson Space Center and um, just kind of 
went from there, uh, went to the University of Texas, built CubeSats in college, uh, was able to do a couple more internships at Johnson working in their robotics division and at JPL working in the OCO2 mission. Nice. And um, APL came knocking my yeah. senior year and said, hey, we've got an opening for you, come do mechanical engineering on Parker Solar Probe. And... Uh, you don't say no to an offer like that. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Well, congrats on the journey. You know, we've had a few guests on here. I actually uh, met uh, Commander Michael uh, Lopez, who mm -hmm. has the, the record for Spacewalks, yeah. um, at, at Sparks and Honey. And I was talking to Terry, who's the founder of Sparks and Honey. He's had a previous episode. And, um, you know, the CubeSat thing is fascinating to me. Yes. Because for a guy that works in startups, you could these, the cost of these things is almost down to $10,000 yep. in some cases. And it, it's cheaper to, to launch a satellite in the space, a CubeSat, than, than to build an app, which I think is insane. Right. I think a lot right. of people don't realize mm -hmm. the opportunity that is actually here right now. Yep. Uh, it's amazing. And it's interesting how a lot of those technologies on the CubeSat world and on the real spacecraft world are very similar. And one of the other enabling technologies for this mission, one of the other reasons we haven't done it in 60 years is because the autonomy and the computing power to really fly this mission wasn't there. And you're seeing now CubeSats that are as smart as satellites from 10 years ago. Yeah. And this spacecraft only had that processing power because it's almost entirely autonomous. In fact, the, the sun is a big radio interference source. So when we fly our close approaches, we lose contact with the spacecraft because we simply don't have the power in our antennas to, to boost over that interference. It's a huge challenge on an autonomy and fault management side for a spacecraft to fly that close to the sun with very tight tolerances for pointing accuracy yeah. and be able to recover from a fault, be able to correct itself, be able to not put itself in a position where you're going to damage flight hardware. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because I just heard in the other room that, you know, Voyager... Fifth, almost 50 years later, still yep. sending signals back, right? But, you know, not as close to the sun, less interference. Right. So really interesting. Can you give the, the listeners here just a really quick high level, you know, how long is the mission? I heard it's doing some laps around Venus. Sure. Um, what, what's going on at a high level? So we, we launched the spacecraft um, here in a couple days. Our window is early in the morning. It's around 3. And we actually launched towards Venus. Um, getting to the sun is difficult because if you picture the solar system and the Earth going around the sun, the Earth has quite a bit of velocity around the sun. And to get close to the sun, you actually need to lose that velocity to bring your orbit in closer. So when we launch, we're actually launching against Earth's velocity. And it's the reason we have such a big rocket, because we're actually trying to speed down from Earth. Yeah, it's the um, second biggest rocket on the planet, right? It is the second biggest. Yeah, it's the Delta IV Heavy. Yeah. And it's going to be a spectacular launch, especially a night launch. Um, we fly towards Venus, and we do a gravity assist. And it's not a gravity assist in the way that spacecraft go into the outer planets do a gravity assist, where they increase their speed. We actually decrease our speed. Okay. And again, the decrease in speed there helps us get closer to the sun. Um, our first close approach happens approximately three months after launch, and the entire mission is a seven-year mission. So we do have a highly elliptical orbit. We swing by the sun numerous times. We swing by Venus seven times, and every time we swing by Venus, we swing in the orbit closer and closer until the last three orbits of the notional lifetime where we get to that closest approach to the sun. The, uh, the 9.86 solar radii is a number that we use. And to, to put that in context, if you were to put the Earth on one side of a football field and the sun on the other, at that point in the mission, we're inside the four-yard line. Nice. Awesome. Well, hey, this has been amazing. Um, looking forward to connecting with a few other of your colleagues here. Um, but thank you for taking a few minutes and uh, kind of giving an overview and sharing your story. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Visit Ambition Today online at syscard.co and follow the show on social media at Ambition Today. 10, 9, Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Oh my gosh. Oh my This is happening. <gasps> oh, wow. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh.
Thanks for listening to Ambition Today. Be sure to visit Siskar.co to get all the information from this episode and more great content. Until next time, stay curious, everyone.